Alright folks, most of you are used to seeing harp videos that are trying to scare you or talk about the uh, weapon of mass destruction, but it is a tool for studying the ionosphere and it just so happens we have something interesting going on. Now some of you know uh, the flux gate magnetometer and the VHF Rio meter which respectively measure the horizontal disturbance in our magnetosphere and ionospheric absorption. And most of you, if you're familiar with harp at all, know the induction magnetometer where you can tell if they're using harp via the horizontal line that'll appear right around 2.5 megahertz. This is one of the ones that most people don't know a whole lot about, and that's the different digisons, uh, the ionison, the harp ionison, if you will. We're going to try to teach you something about it today because there's something interesting going on. Uh, and it's with our ionosphere, which is the level of free-flowing uh, electrons and uh, ions uh, in our atmosphere. Now we break them up and the plot variables are all the different uh, all the different uh, frequencies they measure and what we're going to be focusing on here are the top two the FOF2 and the FOF1 which measure the two different layers F2 and F1 of the F layer itself uh, in our ionosphere which is uh, the critical layer for wave propagation and for bouncing frequencies back down to the earth now uh, in this little chart here, up is space, down is earth. Uh, we have uh, in between the O lines uh, is the F layer right there between about 150 kilometers above the surface and uh, the top side is about 500 to 800. Now what we're going to be measuring here when we go back to the digisons is the critical frequencies of the FOF1 layer and the FOF2 layer. Now what that means is the critical frequency is the highest frequency wave that can be bounced back off of that layer. So if you try to propagate a higher frequency wave than the critical frequency of that layer, it's going to pass right through it and go off uh, higher and perhaps off into space. Um, and the layer that they use is uh, the FOF2 um, and for obvious reasons the FOF1 value is very important as well because uh, the FOF2 critical value is the highest that they can propagate but anything lower than the FOF1 critical value is not going to get to the F2 critical layer it's going to bounce off uh, the bottom part of the F layer and it's not going to propagate uh, properly back down to the earth now we come here uh, and we take a look at this plot uh, we take it out three months and you can see that uh, we have a pretty sharp increase and it's not just like we have a few dots up there uh, what's interesting about this is you can see frequency on the left and height uh, above the surface uh, in kilometers on the right there and you can see the bars pretty well go up above the 10 megahertz 500 kilometer range take it out to one year you can see, uh, pay no attention to that break there earlier in the year, it happened sometimes. So we pull up the previous year, we can see, yeah, we got a couple little dots, a couple little anomalies up close to that line, but we were way up there before uh, with straight bars. Uh, and if you go back a few years, we can see this trend continuing, although uh, before 2006, we did have uh, a fair amount of uh, high critical layers uh, above the 10 megahertz range on our F uh, on our F2 layer. Let's look at the F1 layer. We have the same increase right here, and you see we're starting to rise pretty sharply here uh, to the point we can say that this is not an anomaly. We de are definitely having an increase in um, in the F1 uh, critical frequency, and unlike the F2 frequency back as far as you can go. You can take this thing back as far as you want. It just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, of course, what that translates to mean, of course, is that the critical frequency of the F1 layer is getting larger and larger and larger. Now, this means uh, a few things, and what's perhaps more interesting is what's causing it. Uh, what this means is that uh, as the F1 layer gets higher, or the higher frequency wave must be propagated to get through that up to the F2 layer. Now, accordingly, the F2 layer happens to be going up now as well, uh, so they do still have a wide range uh, to play with to study the ionosphere in that way. Um, but it is going to have to change the way they, they do things if this pattern continues. 
more interesting thing is why is this happening? What is causing the ionosphere to strengthen? And that is exactly what is happening as we see a rise in the critical values. Well, as the magnetic field fades, and we all know it is, I mean, we're having geomagnetic storms off of glancing blows. In fact, the one we have today, October 24th, uh, came from a slow-moving tiny CME back on the 16th that we had pretty much written off. And as the magnetosphere fails, more of the, uh, the harmful things that the sun is firing at us gets through. It's exciting our ionosphere. It's exciting all parts of our atmosphere. In fact, all the planets. That's why Jupiter looks so big. I mean, it hasn't gained any mass and it's no closer in orbit, but it looks huge. Well, why? Well, its atmosphere is excited just like ours, the same thing that's causing the decay rates of the satellites to fall faster. And yes, it hasn't caused anything serious yet, but it almost did during the Ellen in alignment on September 26th. You remember, all hell almost broke loose, and really, truly, it did. If this pattern continues, it's really not good, folks. All eyes need to be on the sun, and frankly, on HARP for the tool that it is. Be safe.